Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series, which is co-sponsored by the Haas Sports Club. I am so excited to introduce today's distinguished guest, former Haas faculty member, Sandy Alderson, president of the New York Mets. We were really fortunate to have Sandy as a member of our Haas faculty. He was teaching a very popular sports business course at both the undergraduate and the MBA levels. And he just told me that teaching at Haas was really one of the highlights of his career, which made me feel wonderful. Sandy began his career in baseball in 1983 when he was named the vice president of baseball operations at the Oakland A's. He was the general manager of the A's teams that won three consecutive American League pennants from 1988 to 1990 and won the World Series in 1989. He then helped baseball expand internationally in his role as the executive vice president of uh, baseball operations for Major League Baseball. And he did that for seven years. In 2005, he returned to the front office as CEO of the San Diego Padres, leading the franchise to back-to-back -back playoff appearances for the first time in club history. And he joined the Mets as general manager in 2010 and won Baseball Executive of the Year in 2015. He is perhaps best known for his pioneering use of statistical analysis of players. And I know we'll hear a lot more about that in today's talk. So on behalf of all of us here at Berkeley Haas, welcome back, Sandy. My today's pleasure. Great to have you today. Um, today's conversation will be led by three Haas MBA students who will each introduce themselves. Before we move to our student moderators, I'm actually going to ask the first question to kick off uh, today's uh, Dean Speaker Series. So let me just start and jump right in. This pandemic has required all of us to adapt and make sacrifices. Um, if you talk to administrators at Berkeley or elsewhere, they will tell you that leaders through this pandemic has been the most challenging leadership experience of their career. So what have you, Sandy, learned from leading through this crisis or any other crisis? And has your experience altered your approach to leadership in a lasting way? Uh, Dean, uh, first of all, thanks very much for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, re-engage with the uh, uh, Haas community. Um, so the pandemic, I think, has been characterized by uncertainty, anxiety, um, uh, apprehension. Uh, and part of that, I think, is a result of the pandemic itself and the, and the threat that the virus poses. But I think it's also a reflection of the isolation that many people have felt uh, or the burden of uh, additional responsibilities in the home uh, as related to sort of school age children and a variety of other things. Uh, so on the individual, this has been a really difficult, as we all know, we've all experienced at a very difficult time. From my standpoint, um, I think it's reinforced uh, the basic um, qualities of good leadership. And, um, you know, good leadership tends to uh, have, a, have a disproportionate impact at times of crisis, uh, in, in times of uncertainty. And that's really where leadership uh, shines through, I think. Um, for example, uh, to me, one of, the, one of the hallmarks of good leadership is just good communication. And <clears throat> communication has been made more difficult in some respects, but actually has made, been made easier in other respects. Um, I spend half my day on Zoom calls. And uh, I would say that there's more communication today, admittedly, you know, at a distance, 
uh, than existed before. And so to some extent, it, it's, it's comparable to not having to com commute to work. You know, there's an extra hour or two available to us and Zoom calls uh, uh, provide that same sort of uh, margin, I think. Um, I don't have to get out of my chair and I'm talking to, you know, 40 people at one moment and another 20 at a different moment. Um, so I think there's some lasting changes that will result from the pandemic. And I think easier, more broader, more inclusive communication is, is one of them. Uh, I have meetings every week with um, at least 25 people in the leadership group, which is not just senior leadership, but really down to sort of our middle managers, which is a really positive thing. Um, as a as a company with about 400 employees, we have a uh, Zoom call once a month. So we've really put an emphasis on communication, and communication uh, in and of itself, you know, is probably not going to get the job done. Uh, there, there has to be substance. There has to be, um, in the way that that information is communicated, a sense of, uh, of um, you know, empathy and authenticity. So for me, leadership, you know, when crises arise, that's when leadership becomes super important. And, but I don't think it necessarily changes one. I really do believe you have to have to be authentic in the, in the way you do lead, one does lead. And to the extent that any particular set of circumstances changes one's approach, you have to be very careful about that because, um, you know, leadership is about credibility. It's about confidence uh, in that leadership. Um, I've always felt there are two components. One is professional, the other is personal. In order to be a good leader, you have to be somewhat professionally competent. But more importantly, over time, you have to have personal qualities that um, uh, create confidence in those with whom you're working and allow you to continue um, to lead over a longer period of time. Just professional competence is not going to get it done. I've had, I've had managers that uh, are great tacticians but over 162 game season, they just cannot stay engaged enough or provide the kind of leadership that's necessary over that length of time uh, to sustain the effort. So um, I don't know that crises change leadership, but they challenge leadership. Hi, Sandy. My name is Mo Dubaboy. I'm a first year MBA student at Haas. I'm also one of the co-presidents for the Haas Sports Business Club. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your perspective on leadership in the pandemic. Uh, the first question I have for you today is that you've had several great accomplishments throughout your career. Uh, is there any single highlight that's, that sticks out to you above the rest? Uh, well, thank you for that compliment. I'm not sure it's well-deserved, but um, you know, I think that what I look back on and uh, and am most happy about is uh, the innovation that took place, particularly with the Oakland A's back in the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, we've talked about analytics. Um, we were the first team, I think, to uh, adopt and use analytics as rudimentary as they, as they were at that time. Uh, and that all happened on my drive from home in San Francisco to uh, the Coliseum. It was probably on 880 uh, in Berkeley, where I listened to an NPR uh, segment with uh, one of the few baseball analysts that existed at that time. His name was Eric Walker. So it was very serendipitous the way this uh, all transpired but because i was so new to the to the business to to the game it was an easier approach to player evaluation for me than it would have been um through scouting or player development because i had no experience whatsoever in that so that was one of the innovations we had the first strength and conditioning coach in baseball who was our first base coach so he was a part-time strength and conditioning coach. 
his job was to get people out of bed on the on the road and take them to a uh, put them in a van and take them to a uh, you know some sort of uh, gym away from the hotel. Uh, we were the first team to have a metal skills coach. I mean, metal skills coaches are, I think, ubiquitous now in sport and have proven their value over a long period of time. But I think we were the first to have uh, a mental skills coach. And the other thing uh, <laughs> doesn't really get uh, much attention, but we banned smoking in the Coliseum. And I think we're the first out, outdoor stadium to ban smoking uh, in the uh, a stadium of that size and open air. So I was actually quite proud of that. But I think, you know, those those innovative periods, we used technology to help improve umpires when I was at MLB. Um, so uh, um, I think I think those are the things that uh, I look back on. Obviously, you know, winning the World Series in 1989, we had a crazy team with uh, some really superstar talent. But um probably most, most happy with the innovation over, over a period of time. Thank you. So you hit on a little bit of the early days of, of data analytics. Um, how, how have you seen that evolve in baseball since your early tenure with the A's? Uh, and then secondly, how has the pandemic influenced or accelerated the role of analytics in baseball? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, first of all, the, the, um, Analytics have changed dramatically since the 80s because of one thing, and that is the uh, burgeoning amount of data that exists today. There is so many, so much. There is so much more data that exists today. If you go back to 1983, most of the data we had came out of a box score that was printed in the paper every day, uh, and you sort of had to extrapolate from that and um, as a result, the, the, the analytics of the day were, again, very basic, but also mostly conceptual. These were really theories that appealed to me rather than practical applications. You know, we did some real basic stuff in terms of, uh, um, you know, like league averages and, and modifying uh, statistics for leagues or particular areas, but it was, it was more of a concept at that time. Today, there is data on virtually everything. Um, <clears throat> there's data on pitch framing. There's data, there's exit velocities. There are um, uh, so many different uh, uh, forms of data, particularly on the defensive side, which didn't really exist in the early days. Um, so as a result of, you know, of, of that, explosion of information, it has to be managed in order to reach conclusions based on it has to be managed. It has to, so it has to be gathered, number one, then it has to be interpreted. And then there has to be a decision make, made on that interpretation. And one of the interesting consequences of analytics in baseball is that every team thinks the same way today uh, because the, the data drives you in that direction. Uh, and as a result, everybody's looking for the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, where there are inefficiencies, they're in very narrow pockets. Uh, it's, it's not as broad and dramatic as uh, portrayed in Moneyball. Now it's about pitch framing or it's about um, uh, defensive positioning, whether it's the shift or, or just positioning generally. There are smaller areas where competitive advantage can be uh, uh, gotten, but they're, they're much smaller in uh, proportion. What I've said in, in, in over a long period of time, what I actually believe is that the way to succeed in baseball, and maybe this, this is applicable to other industries as well, is not necessarily to have the, the, the next great idea, but but to, to be able to execute well on the older ideas, you know, ideas that, and, and, and um, approaches, if you can execute on those better than anybody else, um, uh, that can be as valuable as identifying the next new thing and taking advantage potentially of that, because every idea has to be 
translate it into an application. Um, so, you know, baseball decision making, it's like it's an applied science uh, and um, it requires um, good decision makers based on the data. But um, ultimately, it's about gathering the data, interpreting it, and then, then making a good decision. Hi, Sandy. I'm uh, Zach Markell. I'm a student in the evening weekend MBA program. Uh, thank you uh, again for being here today. Um, really interestingly to me is you've led teams with really limited resources and teams with abundance of resources and as well worked in the commissioner's office. Um, how has your approach to leadership and, and building cultures and organizations evolved because of uh, this experience you've had? So I think that, uh, you know, the, the difference between a small market and a, and a big market sports franchise is just the menu of choices. A smaller market has fewer choices. A larger market has uh, more choices. Um, but the decision making has to be good in, in both cases. So even with What's interesting is with a limited menu, <laughs> you don't get caught up in a bunch of uh, uh, distracting choices that uh, you know might lead you in the wrong direction. You just have to write those off and say, well, no, we can't do that. We're not gonna try that. So it's one thing to say, well, a smart market team can't, can't sign a player for what Mookie bets, 300 million. But you know what? That's probably a good thing. <laughs> Because three hundred million dollar contracts don't usually work out. Maybe in the first year they do, the second, third, or fourth. But when you get to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, not so much. So in some sense, it takes you know, as a small market, it takes that off the table and requires you to be more focused on other more traditional aspects of baseball operations: scouting, player development. Um, most teams talk about scouting and player development that they're, they're going to be, they're going to be founded on those two uh, areas. And we all say it, the question is, how do you do it? And so again, you know, execution is, is the most important thing. Okay. You can have a great farm system. All right. So how are you going to do that? Well, you know, um, it, cause it's more than just throwing the bats and balls out there and letting, letting guys play. It's important to have good talent in your system, but if you have a system, which is predicated on, you know, good people, structure, and then a systematic approach uh, and philosophy. Uh, you can you can improve on that talent by, you know, 20 or 30 percent, let's say. So both scouting and player development are important, but ultimately they're the they're the really foundation of even the Los Angeles Dodgers currently. Um, but a small market team really has to focus on that because they have to do it, they have to rotate their roster more frequently just because of, of the dollars. You know, with respect to large market teams, um, again, more choices, more danger <laughs> as a result. Um, and, um, but I think the, the common thread that works through both is um, understanding what your options, one's options are, Always having, uh, I remember in my negotiating class in law school, it was, uh, um, you know, all, always have an alternative to a negotiated outcome. Uh, and that's true. That's true in baseball. It's true in most industries. Um, but with respect to, you know, large market teams, you still have to be disciplined. Even though you're looking at a larger menu, you still have to be disciplined about it. You have to be patient. You have to recognize the importance of long-term versus short-term. Um, it only takes one or two bad $200 million contracts to put you out of commission for four or five years uh, in terms of being able to you know, um, regenerate the roster. Um, at MLB, it was, it was a, uh, somewhat of an administrative position, which was a little bit different. Um, but also, you know, trying to lead through uh, innovation, adaptations, um, 
Um, but I would say that, that there's very little difference between working for a small market and a large market, except for the array of choices that one has. Otherwise, I think the principles and, and the leadership is pretty similar. And so I'm really interested in, in how, when you've joined organizations, um, how you've also changed that culture or imprinted your, sort of, um, your mark on that culture and how that might have been changed by the pandemic in the, in the last year uh, for you at the Mets. Well, what's interesting, you know, at the Mets is that I was there for eight years under old ownership, and now I've been back for four months under new ownership. So I, I kind of knew what, what issues existed. So I had an idea of how I, I would have liked to have changed the culture. Um, before it was kind of a top-down uh, decision-making process. It wasn't very participatory, um, wasn't inclusive. And as a result, it wasn't really collaborative either. Um, that's something I, I wanted to change. And part of that's because I really enjoy talking to people um, at a variety of different levels. You know, I was in the Marine Corps. I loved hanging out with Lance Corporals and PFCs. Um, not that I was, you know, fraternizing, if you will, um, but I like a place that's friendly but professional. That's, that's kind of what, what I'm looking for. And oddly, that's a hard combination to uh, maintain. I mean, it's a hard balance between being friendly and being professional because you can tip to one side or the other pretty easily. Um, and, uh, but but that's, that's what I've, I've tried to achieve. Uh, with the Mets, um, you know, it started with uh, a white paper I did for the uh, prospective owner, prospective new owner, um, setting out what I thought was important in terms of um, organizational culture, um, which, by the way, I think is the foundation of sustainable excellence. You can't you can't sustain excellence over a period of time unless you have created a culture that allows you to do that. And to me, that culture, some of those characteristics are, as I've said before, you know, inclusiveness, collaboration, um, uh, sort of a participatory management. Um, and that's what we're trying to achieve with the Mets. Now we've had a few setbacks in the last couple of months uh, with some people that we've had to terminate for a variety of reasons, but in some sense, those have given our employees, I, I think, a sense of where we're going. And uh, um, obviously actions are more important than just policy, but what actually is going to happen and those actions unfold over a period of time. So what we've also done is we've established um, um, a group that is working on a new statement of mission, values, vision. And, you know, those things are pretty common among companies, but I think they are important as references so that as we carry our, you know, carry out our work day to day, that we have some reference point and, and we're accountable to that. Uh, everybody's accountable to that. And so what I found with baseball fans is they don't like surprises, uh, generally speaking. If you can, you know, if you can articulate a, an approach and then be consistent with that over a period of time, um, I think they appreciate that. What they don't like is surprises or things that appear to be inconsistent. And that's true with employees as well. Um, so by, and it, you know, on, on the player development side, we have a sort of a Mets way of doing things and we create a, we create a, a, a document that outlines that because it's important for players that move from single A to double A to triple A get consistent input from our coaching staff and that our coaching staff is informed of progress at those other levels. So, you know, that kind of communication is important, but also as a reference, it becomes 
uh, a guide for, for what we do and um, um, sets up expectations. And then we have to, we have to satisfy them. Um, I don't think the pandemic, you know, the pandemic has given us, as I've said earlier, an opportunity to communicate, I think more broadly and um, more uh, frequently than we ever did before, which is really a good thing. And we've done it to overcome, you know, as I said, the anxiety, the uncertainty, et cetera. But it's something we have to preserve. We have to, going forward, we have to continue to, you know, communicate better, uh, at least in our case, than, than we did before. Hi, Sandy. Thank you so much for your time and insight today. My name is Kendall Stuscavage, and I am a first year dual degree MBA and master's of public health student. We've spoken quite a bit today about leadership and your approach to leading organizations. What role has mentorship played in your development as a leader, both in baseball and in business? And have any particular mentors been influential in shaping your leadership philosophy? That's a very good question. Um, Yes, I would say there've been, I wouldn't say that it was a, it was a formal mentor mentee uh, relationship, but certainly there are role models that I have, uh, um, I've had over the years that uh, have pointed me, I think, in generally the right direction. Um, you know, the first was um, a uh, fellow Marine uh, years ago in Vietnam, this fellow Marine was a um, Rhodes Scholar, but later a presidential fellow. He was a graduate of uh, Harvard Business School, Baker Scholar, incredible intellect, um, in, in camouflage Marine uniform. Uh, it, was a, it was an odd combination. But uh, just his approach to leadership was uh, really, I think, uh, instrumental for me. Later, um, there was a lawyer at my law firm in San Francisco. His name was Roy Eisenhart. He's part of the Haas family. Um, worked with him, for him, as, a, as an attorney for many years, and then went to work for him with the Oakland A's. Um, uh, Roy was a uh, uh, Bolt Hall graduate. Uh, from Berkeley. Um, but again, you know, somebody who uh, sort of took me under his wing, he gave me this general manager's job. I had no experience whatsoever. I had absolutely no um, uh, previous experience that would have led me to that uh, position. But he selected me because I believed he, he believed in my basic character. It wasn't about my professional competence at that point. It was about these other personal qualities that he at least uh, felt would uh, lead to some success. And that's why, you know, I, I tend to sort of bifurcate the leadership category into, into those two elements because um, good judgment, uh, experience, patience, a little bit of uh, knowledge and um, uh, self-confidence, empathy uh, is correct. One of the things I talk about more, more than anything else is curiosity. Um, but there are a lot of these non-professional qualities that um, you know I think end up, again, as he saw them, not that I necessarily have them, but uh, that's what led to my appointment in that, in that situation and has, and has led me over the years to look at those qualities more closely than uh, professional accomplishment, um, which is also important, but to me, not as important. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Absolutely, it does. Thank you. You've also been extensively involved with international baseball throughout your career. Mm -hmm. How have these experiences contributed to your leadership approach and more broadly to your perspective about the game? Interesting question. Um, 
so for years, I, I, I was involved with international baseball. One of my jobs um, was putting together Olympic baseball teams. And we had one spectacular success and one spectacular failure in the two, 2000 and 2004. Uh, one of my other jobs was to try to keep baseball in the Olympics. And that ultimately failed as well. Um, but interestingly, uh, Peter Ubroth, who, who um, was well-known former commissioner of baseball, who was the head of the uh, USOC, or at least the volunteer head um, for many years. Uh, I had breakfast with him in, in Athens, Greece. And he said, <laughs> with respect to international baseball, the most important thing about international sport is showing up. And, you know, it's not that easy to get to various places, but just showing up. And it, it harkened back to my, what I enjoy doing most uh, is just walking around. You know, walking around leadership is, is uh, more valuable than, than one would think. And just showing up is the same thing. It's, it's, it's just a slightly different context. Um, I really, I really enjoyed the international baseball. It was funny. The head of international baseball was an Italian. <laughs> they don't play much baseball in Italy. Um, the uh, headquarters of the International Baseball Federation was in um, uh, Switzerland, uh, near the Olympic uh, headquarters. Uh, very political. I've often said that the... Um, the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, is the last remaining European empire because it's basically controlled by Europeans and it generates all of its revenues, most of its revenues, from other places around the world. I mean, it's sort of a classic uh, empire. Um, so there were some political lessons to be learned. And, um, you know, ultimately baseball was left out of, uh, out of the Olympics which has a profound effect on international baseball because um, Olympic sports get tremendous support from individual countries, non-Olympic sports do not. Um, but one of the things I tried to do, and I think that you know, unsuccessfully was to broaden the appeal of baseball around the world. We're very popular in certain places. Those places have had baseball as part of their uh, culture for decades. You know, the Caribbean, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, but there are, there are vast places around the world that have no real interest uh, in baseball. Um, tried to put together an extensive program in China. Um, still hasn't been realized. Um, tried to interest baseball in India. You know, one would think that India would be um, very compatible. Um, they play cricket. In many places, they speak English, uh, which makes it easier to coach and um, more familiarity with, you know, hand-oriented uh, sport. We've done nothing in India, really. And what concerns me is that eventually, over time, baseball becomes a more regional sport, uh, not global. Uh, I even appealed to uh, the commissioner at the time to uh, expand our international efforts based on his stated goal of, of uh, uh, increasing the value of franchises. That was, his, that, that was one of his key goals, was to somehow make franchises more valuable than they had been. Um, and my argument was that if we make the game more uh, popular around the world, then baseball will have greater access to global capital. Because unless you can familiarize um, those with uh, the money to invest in places like the Middle East or Russia or China or wherever, you're not going to you're not going to attract those individuals or organizations to baseball. They're going to go to the NBA. They're going to go to soccer. They're going to go. Um, you know, in, to, in, in different directions. That was my last ditch effort 
to try and get uh, more of a focus on international baseball. But there was never, I mean, ultimately there was never any real interest in developing new opportunities for baseball in, in countries where the sport was not then popular, as opposed to just mining the interest in these other countries uh, for revenue that could come back and be distributed to clubs. Uh, could never ever get past that, um, unfortunately. Thanks, Andy. That, that's so interesting. Um, you know, I'm an international economist and we've been involved in global strategy discussions, which sound very much like the one that you were involved in, in ball with somebody like Thomas Friedman claiming the world is flat. And it's very easy to go across borders. And then someone like Gemwatt uh, saying that's not true at all. In fact, the world is very spicy, uh, spiky and culture matters so much. It's very yeah. hard actually uh, export and you really need to think about local conditions. Um, so uh, we're now gonna transition to uh, questions that are submitted from, I guess, from YouTube. And we have a first question here. Um, this question comes from Julian Valera. Uh, he's an undergraduate student at Haas with the, the goal of becoming um, an MLB uh, GM in the near, near future. He wants to know what advice would you give to students like himself who are trying to break into the industry? I would say a couple of things. Um, one is be persistent. Um, it's like publishing your first manuscript. You got you to keep applying till somebody says yes. Um, the second thing is I would, uh, I would focus on uh, a business education, perhaps with an emphasis on statistics um, um, or data management. I'm, given the fact that uh, Haas is building a, a building uh, to house uh, sort of data oriented students, <laughs> that might be a good thing to, to uh, pursue. The other thing I would tell you is, um, so having an analytics background, I think definitely gives an edge. I think there are more people being hired today with an analytics background than with a former baseball, you know, uh, professional or, or uh, coaching experience. And that's a good thing from, from in terms of inclusiveness, because we've just hired a, a number of women analysts and it's, 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 it's providing a way in for, you know, women who either weren't able to play baseball at any age or, you know, obviously there are, there are those, um, there have been those limitations, but it's a great way to get involved. But the other thing I would advise is go out and watch games and scout those games and try to evaluate players and not only demonstrate an interest, but to begin to develop an observational skill that will complement the analytics. Um, and I, I think it's just another way of demonstrating uh, interest, but at the same time, it's kind of a practical way of uh, expanding your um, your exposure to the game, even though it's not a traditional academic setting. Thank you for that. Um, so this this next question from the audience is related to what you're talking about uh, the diversifying of the uh, of the field. This question comes from Jeannie Hong Lee, who's one of our staff members in development and alumni relations. She says, "How do you feel the promotion of Kim Kim Ng?" who's an Asian American female GM by the Martins, might change the landscape for others to advance in professional sports management? I think it will definitely have an impact in that regard. Um, I remember when I was teaching at Haas, there was a woman president of the Oakland Raiders. So it's not, this is unusual because it's actually a baseball operations uh, general, general manager's position. Um, you know, Kim is someone, someone who has been considered before 
And just as I, just as I said earlier about, you know, submitting a manuscript, um, uh, she finally got selected and um, justifiably so. Uh, she's been in the game a long time. She's done a lot of different things. Probably shouldn't have taken this long uh, for her to have gotten that position. But now that she has, I think that um, um, opportunities for women will grow. There's another woman who works for another team who I think could be a general manager. I don't think she wants to be only because she really loves her current organization. So there are, there are other women out there. She's not, um, she's not um, the only one who is quali- is, would be qualified uh, and, and uh, is available. So, but at the same time, I do think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the um, pipeline for women in baseball operations is um, um, going to continue to grow. That's great to hear. Um, your advice about resilience uh, reminds me of, of the advice that I've been giving uh, women a lot in these uh, conferences that I intend. I always I like to quote Winston Churchill, right? Where he said, never, never, never give in. I mean, that that determination is mm-hmm. critical. So we yeah. have a, another question here from someone on a totally different line, which is a question from Michael Payne. He says, um, do you have a favorite failure during your time as a baseball executive? or a setback that actually put you on the path to future success? Uh, Excellent question. Um, So yes, the one that comes immediately to mind is uh, one related to um, public relations. I mean, one of the things about sport is that it has such a high profile and and that profile is disproportionate to its importance. So uh, it's like uh, I've had conversations with uh, like president of a university and um, some decisions that were made in the, in the athletic department, which seemed kind of odd and, and uh, you know, upset the alumni, et cetera, et cetera. And okay, it's sports. It's not like, you know, academia. On the other hand, it's kind of a, it, provides a sort of a, uh, an entree to the decision-making that's being made in all these other areas. So that, it, I mean, it's high profile, it's not that important, but it causes people to question, you know, how are they making other decisions? And so um, anyway, public relations is really, you know, important part of sport. And when I was in San Diego, I had a pretty good relationship with the press in Oakland. I went to San Diego and, and it, it major league baseball. I went to San Diego and San Diego, small market like Oakland. So there's only one columnist. There's maybe one radio station that really matters. And maybe one beat writer, somebody that's with the team all the time, maybe three people. If you antagonize one or two of those people, they can turn on you big time and there's no recourse. So I always kept, I kept that in mind when I went to New York and it's not three people in New York, it's 30. You know, they're, they're all over the place, but the lessons from San Diego applied nonetheless. And that is don't antagonize, don't, um, uh, don't prioritize, uh, treat everybody the same, Try to be friendly, be professional. It was just a reminder of how easily um, things can slip. And so in New York, I generally had a very, po- and still do have a very positive relation for the most part with the media. Now, there are always going to be people who are contrarian and want to write something different, but you can't overreact to that. You can't, um, um, uh, again, isolate that individual. You can't be, um, uh, you know, reactive in that way. So actually the lessons of a small market club uh, and any of those experiences applied well in this larger context uh, in New York. So yeah, it didn't go well in San Diego ultimately for me, uh, 
personally. Um, but those lessons uh, help inform my work in New York. Yeah, I, that, that also rings a bell with me. Um, I, I spent some time with the Dean of Columbia Business, Glenn Hubbard, before he stepped down. And Glenn Hubbard has um, had a very unfortunate exchange with um, a documentary filmmaker who wrote a, a film, which I think got an Academy Award called Inside Job. And in Inside Job, there's an exchange between Dean Hubbard and the reporter that led to some very uh, unpleasant consequences. And so what Dean Hubbard always says is, you can't always be great, but really try to avoid being very bad, right? <laughs> Down, the downside risk is very large. Um, yes. So, uh, that that, that uh, resounds with me. I have a question here from one of our faculty members. Uh oh. Uh, here's a question from <laughs> uh, Dimitri Livdan. Um, he says, MLB is the last professional league a salary cap, is it coming? Uh, interesting question. Um, <clears throat> so baseball is the only sport without a salary cap. I think what's happened though, is that the, the competitive balance tax, which was used as a, used to slow down the uh, growth of payrolls has actually become in some ways a cap because very few teams exceed that level and pay that tax. Um, the Mets are currently below that tax, that tax level. We were prepared to go over it this year if we had signed uh, the controversial uh, Trevor Bauer, but, um, but it, it has never, you know, it, it, it has become similar to a salary cap. One of the reasons there is no salary cap in baseball is because the union players association has never agreed to us, has never been willing to agree to a salary floor. Uh, so we don't have a, we don't have a cap, but we don't have a floor either. So the Mets are going to spend about $200 million this year on payroll and Pittsburgh is, is going to, is going to spend about 40. So, um, you know, that's contributed to some problems also. And so is a salary cap coming? I think only if the Players Association eventually changes their whole notion about individual um, rights to negotiate contracts and not placing artificial barriers one way or the other. I think at some point, um, the union will have to decide whether it is willing to get a salary cap. It's uh, Major League Baseball and the union are, are also willing to, to create a salary floor. Right now it doesn't exist, which is, I think, unlike other sports as well. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions here. Uh, one question is you spoke about uh, one of your uh, an inspirations was a Marine who you served with in Vietnam. Yes. He was also a Rose Scholar. What is it about his leadership that inspired you so much? You, did, you didn't tell us what it was. That's the first question. And this yeah. is from um, Kurt Peters. He says, hi, Sandy, I'm a recent EMBA 20 grad. How do you juggle financial performance and on-field performance? And which of those is the number one priority? All right, so let me uh, answer, I'll answer the first question first. Um, so at the time I was in Vietnam, I was a 21 year old Lieutenant, uh, virtually no experience outside of, you know, my academic work, college, graduated from college. Um, and Marines have this, you know, there's this, there's this perception of who Marines are. Um, and this fellow, uh, John Grinnells was the antithesis of, uh, of, you know, what one would expect. Quiet, intellectual, but decisive, 
still very charismatic, but completely different and very consistent with my own approach to leadership, which as I said, is you know friendly but professional and not prone to you know outburst or what have you. Consistency, reliability, credibility, those things. And and that's what he represented. He wasn't a somebody out, you know, uh, saber rattling all the time, uh, overly aggressive, this or that. He was just uh, um, a counterpoint to what one would typically expect in the Marine Corps. And that's why he had a uh, profound impact on me. He retired, this gentleman, as a, as a, as a general and went on to be the superintendent, which is the, similar to being the president of the Citadel at a time when women were um, first being admitted and it was very controversial and he brought a tremendous amount of um, um, sort of equanimity to that process. And uh, uh, so just a, just a, uh, um, a real gentleman. Sadly, recently, and this is just an anecdote, <laughs> So I, I revered this 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 uh, guy for for decades, and then a few months ago, it must have been uh, October, as a former general, he signed a letter in support of Donald Trump. <laughs> and I wrote him a text. I said, "I can't believe this," and I got a response that wasn't entirely satisfactory, but it uh, and it hasn't changed my opinion of him specifically, but. Um, uh, it was disappointing. Sandy, we had this other question, which is intriguing. Ah, uh, yes. About financials versus performance on the. You know what's interesting? So that the answer to that question varies with circumstances. Um, if, for example, you've had recent success on the field. Uh, maybe winning a league championship or even a world series, but are having financial difficulties, suddenly the financial issues become more important than the competitive ones. And if over time you've been somewhat successful in maintaining, um, uh, you know, a break even or roughly break even um, on the financial side, suddenly the competitive issues become more important. And, Part of that is is fan driven. Um, I mean, you can only be successful financially for so long if you don't have on field success. Ultimately, that's not why. That's not why most owners get involved. It's not because they want to make money. I think it's because they want to have validation. And I think that's what's happening in with the Mets. Um, you know, those that get involved in sports have been successful in other areas and then get involved with sport. Why? I think a lot of personal reasons. Um, so the short answer is that whether finances are, 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 are motivating uh, uh, or the comp competition on the field just depends on where a club is and its history and cycle of success or failure. Thank you. I'm, um, I think we have time for uh, maybe one more question. But I just did want to mention actually that the last individual that uh, we had in the Dean Speaker Series was actually the superintendent or the, the president of the Naval Academy. Ah. Um, so, so you're in good company. Um, uh, so this question comes from Eric Monticelli most important thing you learned from the 2015 World Series run in regard to leading winning teams? Well, it's an interesting, it, it's an interesting uh, um, question because there's no doubt that um, the leadership situation changes and can change dramatically as much from success as it does from failure. People change. Uh, when, when there is success, um, 
you know, it's not like hubris sets in with every individual, but people change. Uh, they've accomplished something. Doing it the second time may or may not be as important as, as it was the first time. Um, people really do change as a result of uh, that change dynamic uh, in the clubhouse, success or failure. Um, uh, one of the things I've also said about leadership which may or may not be true, but I believe it. And that is not all leaders are cut out for all leadership situations. The leadership situations differ from place to place, time to time. And this dynamic of success or failure, young versus old, there, there are a lot of different dynamics at play. And, and one group is not necessarily susceptible to the same leadership approach as another group. And there aren't that many leaders who can do it all, you know, that, that are successful in, in all different types of situations. And so that's why it's sometimes it's difficult to match them up. And some, sometimes we make mistakes. I make mistakes. Maybe I've been, a, I've been a mistake. <laughs> who knows? But, uh, um, that's, that's, that's the dynamic that is sometimes very difficult to, uh, to anticipate, uh, but there's no question. It changes leaders, it changes followers, teammates um, across the board. And uh, um, it's an important consideration. Well, thank you so much, Sandy. We are so grateful to you for coming back to us after having taught at Haas and, and having an amazing career and speaking to us today. And I also want to thank our uh, students, uh, Kendall, Mo, and Zach for, for, for this. It's been, it's been really wonderful. Um, and I wish you all a great day and go Bears. All right, go Bears. <laughs>